have you ever been to like on the station on a bus and you're just sitting here minding your own business and alongside you there's a couple of youths and, and and they are like you know they, they just like know everything there is in the whole world to know you know like no <laughs> and what can you do but roll your eyes and think I could teach you a thing or two <laughs> well we often come to church and think, what's the lesson that I need to learn? Well, today we're going to switch it around. You're not the student. You are the teacher. And you've got a couple of classes to teach. Two of them, in fact. If you've been a teacher, some of these will look familiar. First of all, I teach angels and demons. That sounds familiar for teachers. That's in the first couple of verses. And the other class is saints and sinners. That probably sounds familiar as well. So that's where we're heading through our, our time together today. And you can see four verses we're going to look at. And you think to yourself, how on earth are we going to get through four verses? Well, the answer is very quickly. We're going to just skim through and, and pick up the, the surface. So let's have a look at this first group, this first class that you're going to teach. Angels and demons. You teach angels and demons? Indeed, that's what our text says. That the wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities, not in Canberra, but in heavenly realms. This is the angels and the demons. This is the spiritual forces. This is the reality that's beyond the world that we can see. And this is the group that we are going to be teaching, that we are indeed teaching. And that theme of we teach the angels picks up again and again through scripture. Here's one example, quite a clear one. Now concerning the salvation that we have, even the angels long to look into these things. You know, the angels are fascinated by what God is doing in your life. They are, they are amazed. Well, the rest of us are pretty amazed as well. But even the angels long to see the impact that salvation has. A another reference uh, about gender issues, which is you know, a hot topic these days. Man, mankind, is the glory, uh, the image and the glory of God. So women should do X, men should do Y. Why? because of the angels. Again, the angels are looking at you to see what God is doing. So what are we going to teach angels and demons? We've got a few things that are on the curriculum. First of all, that God is proactive. God is taking the initiative. God is on the front foot in doing things in this world. Look at our text again from Ephesians 3. God's intention was that now, it's happening now, God is taking the initiative now, God is at work now. Again, this, this present continuous God at work comes up again and again through scripture. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. God is at work here and now. We need to remind ourselves that God is very much active. And where is he active? He's active in the church. The church is the key to what God wants to do in this world. Again, back in our text. God's intention was that now, how is he going to act? Do you need three guesses? Through the church. This is how God is working today, through us, through the church. Now, I've got some bad news for you. Satan reads the Bible. In fact, Satan knows the Bible better than you. Satan has memorized the Bible. Satan quoted the Bible to Jesus in the temptation in the wilderness. He knows scripture and he was able to read those Old Testament prophecies that predicted when Jesus would arrive the first time. How, when, where, even why he would come. It's spelt out 
very clearly through scripture there could be no doubt even though satan knew the coming of the savior the old testament told him nothing about the church this was something that caught him flat-footed where would this come from he was used to dealing with uh, the jews just one tribe one people one family but now suddenly god's got people all over the world from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and they're all part of his family satan didn't see that coming how do we know well just back up one verse before our text in ephesians 3 the administration of this mystery this mystery that was for in ages past was kept hidden it was in the mind of god but it wasn't revealed by god and the mystery is that through the gospel the gentiles are heirs together with israel members together of one body sharers together in the promise in christ jesus this was a new thing that god broke onto the world in the first century here it is and satan is still running around like a headless chook trying to get on top of the fact that god is using us the church to do the things that amaze angels and demons you probably know the words don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together don't don't stop meeting together but look at the context in which those words come from hebrews 10 and it's all about us and being together it's the church in action let us draw near our hearts sprinkled cleanse us having our let us hold unswervingly the hope we confess let us consider how we may spur one another on and not give up meeting together some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another this is all about the church in action this is us getting together it's so important in god's plan that we be together that week by week we gather to celebrate that we stay in touch with one another that we live out what it is to be the body of christ the bride of christ the people of god and not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing because if we fail to obey this satan is laughing he doesn't want the church in action let's not give up meeting together this gathering is a priority in god's program it ought to be a priority for us in our program and when the church gathers together the other thing that we need to teach is that wisdom is the answer to what god is doing in the church and in the world it's all about his wisdom again back in our text ephesians 3 it was god's intention that now through the church the manifold wisdom of god should be made known to these rulers and authorities in heavenly realm he wants his wisdom to be displayed to the angels and demons now the angels already know angels witness the power and glory of god as they watched him being creation into being angels created on the first day of creation they saw and they celebrated the stars the moon the planets the, the galaxies the solar system everything brought into being they sang god's praises as he did his creative works they know about his power and glory but the thing that they are still learning is god's wisdom this is the attribute for this age that god wants to make known above all else power and glory is all very exciting but the wisdom is what makes the difference 
we're told in another verse that unsaved people look at God's plan of salvation and what do they think about it? They think the plan of salvation is foolishness. But look at this. Here's another verse about the angels from Jesus himself. The angels watch and celebrate God's saving wisdom, mercy and grace. I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what are the angels focusing on? The wisdom of God. His wisdom gets top billing amongst the attributes that he's displaying. The wisdom of God is the thing that he wants to be preeminent in this age. So the angels watch and celebrate. The angels rejoice as that wisdom is brought into practice. And notice something about this wisdom. It's called in this translation the manifold <coughs> wisdom of God. Now you're talking boy talk. Manifold. It, yeah, let, let's get down to some really good theology here. Now, th th this, as the boys will see, is uh, an inlet manifold on the left and an exhaust manifold on the right. And look at this on, on the left. Dual carbs. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, it is, uh, and a, a straight six uh, cylinder. It, it comes out of a 1965 um, Triumph Vitesse, a hot little number in its day. Yeah. <coughs> I, I, I digress, excuse me. The, we're, the manifold wisdom of God. You know what a manifold does? It, it, it takes something, the, in the carburetor side, it's taking the fuel in the air and dispersing it out into each of the cylinders. The exhaust is multi-branched into each of the cylinders. So the manifold wisdom of God is something that is multi-branched, something that reaches out into every part. If you're not really into uh, manifolds, the, the very same word is used, the biblical word is used in gardening. Can you pick the theme of what we have here? What sort of leaves are these? <laughs> Of various sorts. You know, don't get locked into just one type. Because how are the leaves described? They are variegated leaves. You see that? The variegated is exactly the same as manifold. It's the different colours that come out. And the variegated is how the wisdom of God is described. It's multicoloured, multi-hued. It's seen in many different facets and in different lights and different times. It comes out in other colours. The wisdom of God, it can't be locked into, oh, it happens just like this. And we think salvation it happens in only one way. It happens only through Jesus, through his death on the cross. But the wisdom of God is manifold, variegated, multi-branched, multi-coloured, multifaceted. There is just no way of exploring the depth and breadth and width of the wisdom of God. And so now the manifold, variegated wisdom of God is known by the church, through the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We are showing just how rich is God's wisdom by how we do church, how we be the church. Wisdom is God's answer to the universe. The next thing we are to teach this class is that God's purpose has been accomplished. God's intention was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, because we're in class, let's go back to third class. It's where I peaked. Well, actually, I probably, <laughs> probably peaked before that. I was on downhill by third class. <coughs> Past, present, 
and future tense. He accomplished. Past, present or future? Past. It doesn't say his purpose that he will accomplish, which would have been future. It doesn't say his purpose that he is accomplishing, which would be present. But it's done. It's what he has already accomplished. It's completed. It's finalised. It's locked down. It's solid. It can't be changed because it's past. It's history. And God's purpose has already been accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it has an impact through to us in the present. So God's purpose in the past is accomplished. And so in the present, God's wisdom is now being shown. The wisdom of the cross, of what was accomplished back at Calvary, is now being displayed by how we live out what it is to be the people who are saved. God's purpose, his eternal purpose, accomplished in the past was in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the impact that that has for us today is that God's wisdom is being shown through the church. So we're not divorced from the past, but based on what God has done for us back then, we now step into a place of living out his wisdom day by day. And some people come and say, Oh, Pastor, what is God's purpose for my life? Um, your purpose is the cross. The purpose has been accomplished. God's eternal purpose is accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's all about the cross. It's about getting saved and then grabbing the wisdom to live that salvation day by day. We see that it's accomplished. It's done. You can't change it. It's absolutely sure and not open for debate. God saves. End of story. And that's why the focus is on Jesus. The purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not about you or me. The, the centre of the universe is in fact Christ, not us. And so when it comes down to it, who's in charge? Jesus is Lord. End of story. And we need to have the wisdom to centre our lives around him. So class dismissed. Next class. Let's move into knowing that we teach both saints and and sinners. And this is what we find in the, the next couple of verses in our text. I teach saints and sinners. And what are we going to teach them? What's on the curriculum? That Jesus is the way. He always has been the way. There is no other option there. God's eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus is our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God. There is no other way. It's only in and through Christ, through who he is and what he's done, particularly through his death and resurrection. Now, the world is going to offer you lots of options and possibilities. Oh, this philosophy or that religion. There's no end to what is presented to us. But there is only one way that's going to get us out of our sin and into the place of the saved in heaven. And Jesus is that way, the one and only way that we can get to God. We need to teach the saints and sinners around us that God is available to them, readily available, easily available. He is always available. So our text in Ephesians 3 says, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God. The possibility is there for us. There's no doubt about that. We may indeed approach with freedom and with confidence. So 
the door to God is wherever we happen to be. And we can open that door at any time and find him. He said himself way back in Jeremiah's day, back in the Old Testament, I am God who is near, declares the Lord. Not a God who is far off. He's right here. Wherever we are, he's right here. And then look at some examples that I just picked randomly out of the, the scripture about the nearness that God has to us. So um, Paul telling the sinners in, in Athens. Ooh, that's a bit close to home, isn't it? Uh, God is not far from each one of us. Or through the Psalms, there's lots and lots of examples. The Lord is near to all who call. You are near, O Lord. The Lord is, Lord is near the brokenhearted. The Lord is at my right hand. You need never think that God is far away. He's always right here. Well, then why does he not feel so close? Why do I think that he's far, far away? Well, what we need to do is take our position, which we've just seen in Scripture, our position is near him, and put it into practice. We've got to live out the truth of Scripture, not just believe it in our head, but put it into practice in how we live our lives. And so we read to the God who is near, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. If he doesn't feel close, maybe there's something wrong with my heart. My heart, not his. Or again, another one. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We need to do the drawing. We need to do the stepping. We need to go through that door. He is here, but we need to put into practice what it is to talk to him, to reach out to him, to tell him, what's going on in our lives and sometimes it's not fun which is why one of the things we need to teach is that suffering is still not finished we live in a broken world as you fully know and things go wrong and so our text says therefore on the basis of all that's gone on before therefore I ask you not to be discouraged because of my sufferings. If even apostles suffer, what hope of the rest of us God of getting out of that? It's going to happen. Bad things are going to happen in a broken world. Look at what Jesus said. This is the upper room. This is the last chance he gets to teach the most important things to his disciples. And he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. It doesn't stop the trouble. We will have trouble. It's a statement of fact. It's even a promise. It's going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. They, and they, I can look around this room and I can tell. Every single one of you has had bad things happen to you. And they just keep on happening in the world that we live in. But don't stop at the bad things because it's not the full picture. It's only a minute part of the picture because Jesus has got something for us to do and there's something that he does. He's already done his bit. Uh, this is, okay, now you take heart. This is something we need to do day by day. And there's something that he's already done. And it is, he has overcome the world. Past tense again. Don't you love tenses? It's the only bit of grammar I remember, but I love it. And so we can come into another cross-reference. Look at Romans chapter 5. We rejoice in our sufferings. Oh. <laughs> Who's he kidding? Well, we don't rejoice that we are suffering. We rejoice at the consequences. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that 
suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint, doesn't put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. There's something good going to come. Suffering is not good. Don't pretend that it is. But something good is going to come in spite of that. Um, James chapter 1 is uh, a passage you might know even better. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Uh huh. You're not quite on the same page with this one, are we? But look, look at how it unfolds. Because you know, again, here's this knowledge. We can lock into this. It comes out, knowledge and suffering go together. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, that perseverance finishes its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Here's why we can consider it pure joy. Not because the suffering is joyful, but because of what can come out of it. How do you do it? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Here it is again. What is it that is God's key, God's cure? It is his wisdom. Not his power and glory. His wisdom is what we're zeroing in on. So let's delve into this and see that the wisdom is so important. Whenever you face trials, suffering and tests, whenever you fall into that hole, as you will from time to time, the natural consequence is grief. Don't wriggle out of that. If something bad happens, grieve complain, whinge, cry, moan, you know, don't kick the cat, but you know, kick, kick something because it's a bad thing that's happening and you need to grieve because your grief is, is a way of understanding the depth of the suffering. And God gave you grief as a gift, this emotion of grief, because that's exactly what he has. God himself grieves. He has emotions and we're made in his image and that's why we have emotions. But again, that's not the whole story. That's part of the story, an important part. How do you get out of that hole and up onto this platform where you can enjoy the virtues and the, the qualities of life and the character traits that make a positive difference in our lives and they're the things ultimately that lead on to count it pure joy you can rejoice so what's this text James chapter 1 tell us is the way that we do that what's our own scripture text today in Ephesians 3 telling us it is wisdom that does it you don't need a high IQ to go from suffering and trials to developing godly character. You don't need degrees and qualifications. You don't need to be smart. What you need is something that's unrelated to the number of brain cells you still have functioning. And it is wisdom. Because wisdom is taking what you do know and putting it into practice. Wisdom is practiced knowledge. It's where you take whatever you know, large or small, and you live it out. And as you take this grievous situation and you say, God, this sucks. This stinks. I don't like this. And then you start applying his scripture his word his the knowledge of his presence you get into a place of growing to be more like him and that takes you ultimately place of i rejoice in spite of what happened to me that i didn't like and that takes us into our last point that beyond suffering benefits are accruing to us very positive benefits 
are coming our way. Therefore I ask you not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. Here is the good thing that's coming beyond suffering. There is glory, there is good. And look at this fabulous verse. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Look at the contrast in that. What we have now, the bad things that happen, and they are bad things, put them in perspective, they are a light affliction compared to the glory that is being weighed down upon us in this life and for what's to come as God works in our lives. Look again. What we suffer in this life is but for a moment. Blink of an eye, click of the fingers and it's gone. And how does that compare to the far more exceeding and eternal weight that awaits for us as glory? See things in perspective and teach angels and demons, saints and sinners that yes, this world is broken but there's something better that we are already enjoying because coming home is going to be worth it. It won't be easy, but it will be worth it. It will be worth it. Now and then. Let me pray. Father, this world is broken. We know it, we see it, we experience it and have done so far too often. We ask for your mercy and your grace that we would recognise dangers and difficulties and trials and have your wisdom to be able to minimise how we deal with those difficult things so that we experience less grief and more wisdom to step into a better place, your place, that makes a positive difference in our lives. Thank you for all that you have done in Christ, all that you are doing through your spirit and your church, and may we live out what it is to be your people, your glory, your son's bride, your heart's delight to be your church this day to eternity and forever and ever. Amen.